Hey guys, we're gonna do lesson 61 today. We already did lesson 60 on the last video. Um, you should have also done your unit 12 test, which is open books since you're at home. For lesson review, that's on page 91, I believe. Yes, and for your student workbook, it's on page 165. So that's an open book test for unit 12. I'll grade those when we get back from Thanksgiving break. Let's go ahead and get started on lesson 61. We're on page 405. Um, we're going to be talking about the Middle Ages. Um, historians label the period of history of Europe from the fall of Rome until about 1300 as the Middle Ages because it came between ancient history and the Renaissance. In Unit 13, we learn about events during the early Middle Ages in locations from Central America to the islands of Japan. An uncle and a, a nephew born as peasants in Macedonia region of the Balkan Peninsula rose to become rulers of the Byzantine Empire. That's who we're going to learn about today. On islands off the coast of Asia, the Yamato clan began to unite the various clans of Japan. We won't learn about that today. An Arab born on the Arabian Peninsula began a new religion that spread by teaching and by force. Uh, into the Western India and Middle East and Northern Africa. I bet you guys can guess what religion that is. The Maya civilization flourished in Central America and built the grand city of, mm, I can't pronounce this correctly, Palinqua. After Pope Gregory I sent missionaries to England, a monk and a monastery on Linsafarn Island created a beautiful illuminated manuscript. And those manuscripts are the four gospels, which we all cherish today. Okay. We're on page 405, let's get started. The first question for lesson review on page 31, you should be getting ready to write that down. Uh, the answer that is, who was Justinian's wife and how did she help Justinian in his work? Well, let's read about Justinian and we'll find out who his wife was, okay? The Roman Empire began to take control of the Balkan Peninsula in 9 AD, we're in AD now, and eventually governed the entire region. The Romans planted vineyards engaged in gold mining and established cities along the coast. Many men born to peasant families in Balkans became officers in the Roman Empire. Since Roman armies frequently put their commanders um, forward as emperors from the 200s into the 500 ADs, several military commanders from Balkans became emperors at either Rome or Constantinople. And remember, Rome is one capital and Constantinople is the other. And Constantinople is the capital of the West and Rome is the capital of the Eastern part of Rome. All right, um, Domitian and Constantine are two such emperors who we have already mentioned. Around 450, Justin was born into a peasant family, which means a poorer family, in the Macedonian region of the Balkans. He herded pigs as a young man. Hmm. Justin moved to Constantinople when he was about 20. Justin became a member of the palace guard and rose to hold a high military position. Wow, he worked his way up. While he was a military officer, his nephew, Justinian, who was born in 483, also from Macedonia, moved to Constantinople and received his education there. As a young man, Justinian was a key advisor to his uncle, so he helped his uncle. Justin became emperor, his uncle became emperor. Uh, he was known as Justin I in 518. Justin I had no children, so he adopted Justinian as his son. And we know that a lot of uh, people in power would do that if they didn't have any sons to take the heir. They would adopt a nephew or somebody in their family so that they knew their family line would be in control. In 527, Justinian was named co-emperor. His nephew was named co-emperor, maybe because they knew that Justin wasn't going to be emperor for very much longer. Oh, just a few months before his uncle died. Following Justin's death on August 1st, 527, Justinian was proclaimed sole emperor of the Byzantine Empire. So a mosaic of Justinian, oh, you can see the mosaic of Justinian on page 403. He is known as Justinian I. This is because a Byzantine emperor who served much later was also called Justinian. Before he became emperor, Justinian married, here's the answer to number one, Theodora, a former actress. Now that's the first part of question number one. We're looking for the second part and how she helped her husband, right? 
because that says, how did she help Justinian in his work? So the first part is her name is Theodora. We're gonna find out how she helped him. This one was an intelligent person with significant political skills. Theodora had a great influence on her husband and on the Byzantine Empire. When Justinian was named co-emperor, Theodora was crowned Augusta or second in rank. That's pretty high up. When Justinian became sole emperor, Theodora was given the title of empress and continued to be active as a political advisor to her husband. So the answer, uh, the second part of answer number one is that she was a political advisor to her husband. All right, question number two. With whom did the Byzantine armies fight along the Euphrates River? All right, war against the Persians. When Justinian became emperor, Byzantine armies were already fighting the Persians along the Euphrates River. And there's our answer to question number two. It's, it's the Persians, all right? Justinian and the King of Persia agreed to the Treaty of Eternal Peace in 532. However, the peace established by the treaty was not eternal. Persian armies invaded the Bi Byzantine Empire in 540. Every few years, the two sides made a truce to stop the fighting, but the truces continued to break down and the two sides fought again and again and again. Finally, Byzantium and Persia agreed to a 50-year truce around 561. In the end, Byzantium did not lose any territory during the war with Persia. However, the Byzantines agreed to pay a considerable amount of gold to the Persians each year. And you can see a picture on page 406 of those gold coins. Those are pretty nifty. And if you had some of those coins today, I bet they'd be worth a good bit of money. All right. Wars to reclaim the Western Empire. Justinian wanted to regain control of the areas that had been part of the Western Roman Empire. In 533, you can follow along, we're on page 406. In 533, he sent a force to Northern Africa and regain control of Carthage and other areas that the Vandals had invaded. A Byzantine force also invaded Italy, which had been taken over by Ostrogoths. The Byzantines gained control of Rome in 541, but the Ostrogoths continued to fight until 562. Byzantine forces were not able to hold on to the territory. Constant warfare there took so many men and resources that when the Lombards, a barbarian nation from what is now Germany and Austria, invaded Italy, when the Lombards invaded Italy, Byzantine forces were not able to drive them out. Three years after Justinian's death in 565, the Lombards, those people that came in from Germany and Austria, took control of Italy. All right, wars in the Balkans. We're on page 406 on the last paragraph. Follow along. Justinian also had to fight battles close to home. Barbarians, barbarian Bulgars and Slavs repeatedly invaded the Balkans and once even got close to Constantinople. They did a great deal of damage in the region and the Bulgars and Slavs eventually settled in what had been territory claimed by the Byzantines. These foreign invasions caused many citizens in the empire to see Justinian as a poor leader. Oh boy. Foreign trade, all right? So when you're trading with other countries, we're gonna learn about that. Justinian encouraged foreign trade, especially in spices, perfume, and silk. And we learned about the Silk Road and how silk was made. Remember the silk moth? Well, silkworm, but it's really a moth. He encouraged the introduction of silkworms into the empire so that the Byzantines would not have to go through Persia territory to obtain silk from China because it came from China. Remember that Silk Road was from China all the way it made it all its way to Rome. Um, Byzantine artists created beautiful metal works as seen in the examples on right. You can look at the cross and all the different things. By the 500s, the Byzantines were trading with the Visigoths of Spain. An artist in Constantinople likely made the earrings shown, um, shown in the picture, uh, but they were found in Spain. The need for fair laws. We always need fair laws. A society must have a reliable system of laws if it's going to function well. People have to know what is legal and what is illegal as well as what laws mean. We need to understand our laws as citizens in a country so that in case there's ever any trouble or we are doing something that someone else says is not right, we need to know our own rights to make sure that what they're saying is true. We just need to understand that, right? 
They also need to know that laws will be enforced in a way that is consistent and fair. Americans are familiar with a system of government in which an elected body of representatives, such as Congress, the state legislator, or the city council passes laws. Then the police or other officers enforce the law against each person without regard to that person's wealth or status in society. An existing law might be changed by an act of legis legislator, but usually two laws that say opposite things will not be enforced at the same time, which makes sense. The Roman system of law had been established in the 400s BC. It had worked well at first. Over the centuries, however, the Roman legal system had developed problems. For instance, there was not a consistent way for laws to be made. Hmm. During the time of the Roman Empire, uh, from Augustus Caesar forward, emperors were all powerful. They issued decrees that had to be obeyed as laws. However, sometimes a decree of one emperor conflicted with the decree of an earlier emperor, which one had to be obeyed. Hmm. <coughs> Government authorities did not always enforce laws fairly on all people. Wealthier, wealthy people or members of certain families often did not have to pay their taxes or they might not have to stand trial for breaking a law. So we see favoritism, don't we? Corruption was common. For instance, men often bribed, um, often paid bribes to the emperor so they would be appointed as governor of province. So instead of asking the people to vote who they wanted to be governor, the person that wanted to be governor would pay money to that emperor and that emperor would appoint them as governor. So that's unfair, a bribe is never good. Sometimes these men were in debt after paying a large sum of money for a bribe. They would often raise taxes on the people they governed so that they could collect the money they needed to pay off all their debts. That's a very corrupt way to live. All right, the Code of Justinian. All right, next question. What was the purpose of the Code of Justinian? And I have a feeling that we're gonna find that right here. Justinian wanted to make sure that the laws of the empire made sense and were applied equally, equally to all people. So there's our beginning of our first answer. The code of Justinian was made so that the laws of the empire made sense, this is on page 408, and were applied equally to all people. He also wanted to get rid of corruption. That also goes in your answer. The reason it was made is because he wanted to get rid of the corruption that was happening that we just read about, okay? Soon after he became emperor, Justinian appointed a commission to organize the laws of the empire. He later appointed additional commissions to work on other parts of the legal system. Now we're going to hear about those different parts. The result of their work is called in Latin corpus juris civilis, or the body of civil law. It is also known as the Code of Justinian. The Code of Justinian was an important building block for later legal systems in Europe. It took many years to complete this work and it was made up of four parts. Here are the four parts. The Codex Constantinium, oh wow. Also called simply the Codex. I like that better. It was 10 books that sorted out all the laws made from Hadrian. Uh, this person ruled from 117 to 130 AD. Until that time, Justinian became emperor. The commissioners decided not to include every decree made by every emperor. Um, those not included were repealed or um, made void, which means they just got rid of them. The Digesta, which is also called the Digest, had 50 books. These were a collection of commentaries by experts in Roman law. Lawyers and judges often refer to such commentaries when applying the law to a particular situation. The commissioners decided lawyers or judges could not cite any comments in court unless they were included in the digest. The institution, the institutions, also called the institutes, was a textbook on the law for first year law students to study. See a page, they have a page of it, uh, a later copy of the institutions at right. Cool. The novel, novella constitutions post Codicium. This is all in Latin, so if you take Latin, you probably can pronounce this much better than I, which means new laws after the codex, usually called the novels. Oh, that's where we get that word, novels, from the Latin word. Interesting, novella. Collected the decrees Justinian issued after the codex was published. All right. Justinian made the paying of bribes for governed ships illegal, so you could no longer bribe your way in, and he worked to eliminate corrupt practices in government. 
the emperor gave more authority to local officials called defensors, civitatis, defenders of the cities. This enabled local citizens to have cases heard in court more easily. It kind of sounds like our, our system. Okay, the Nika Revolt of 532, and this goes with our next question. What was the Nika Revolt of 532? And I bet we're going to find out here because that's what the title is. Besides working, we're, on, we're in the middle of page 409, following one. Besides working to eliminate corruption, Justinian made the collection of taxes more efficient. Both of these changes displeased many who were wealthy. He also cut back on the services that the government provided, which displeased many of the poor people. The people expressed their discontent by violently uprising in Constantinople in 532. So these people that were upset about not having the government provide more things for them, they um, kind of rebelled. And that was called the Nika Revolt of 532. That's on page 49. That's our answer. The people expressed their discontent most violently in an uprising in Constantinople 532. And that is your answer to number four. Did you hear that? Number four, right here. Rebels cried Nika, which means victory. Rioters burned government buildings, part of the emperor's palace, and the church of the holy wisdom that stood beside the palace. Okay, so it's interesting. Again, we can see how, like everything that's happening in our government in the United States, there's been a lot of rebellion in our own country, a burning of government buildings, defacing of uh, government statues. And as a child, you might think that is, it is disheartening and it is a little scary, but it hasn't, it's not anything that hasn't been seen before. The same thing happened here in 532. They burnt those buildings down. And so history just repeats itself, doesn't it? It's very interesting. All right, the mob gathered in Hippodrome, a stadium used for chariot races and public festivals. They demanded that certain government officials resign. The next day, the crowd proclaimed that they wanted the nephew of former emperor to be emperor. Justinian thought about giving up the throne, but Theodora, his wife, convinced him to stay in office. General Belisarus, who had served Justinian in wars on many fronts, organized his troops and put to death many of the mob in Hippodrome. The others dispersed. Well, that got rid of them real quick because he just put him to death. Whew. All right. The new Aya Mosque. And I looked up that word because I thought this is interesting because the Aya Mosque is actually, it's not, it's a mosque today, excuse me. The new Aya Sophia. It's a mosque today, but we're going to hear about what it actually was. Uh-huh. That's right. Um, and number five is why do you think it's important for society to have a reliable system of laws? So why do you think it's important that we can trust the laws that have been made by officials and governors and people in higher places than us, the citizens? Why is that important to you? I'm looking forward to seeing some answers for number five. All right. The new Aya Sophia, which is on page 409, Justinian oversaw an active building program. He built aqueducts, bridges, forts, orphanages, and churches. Many earthquakes occurred during the, the reign of Justinian. The government helped rebuild several cities damaged by these quakes. The grandest and most significant project was the rebuilding of the Church of the Holy Wisdom, which Justinian ordered immediately after Nika revolt. The church is usually called Hagia Sophia, which is Greek for Holy Wisdom. Emperor Constantine began the original building. His son, Constantius II dedicated it in 360. Other riots had damaged the church in 404 and it had been dedicated a second time in 415. Justinian appointed Anthemus of Charles and Isadorus of Miletus, Miletus as architects for the new structure. Anthemus, Anthemus was a mathematician and a physician. Isidorus was a professor of geometry and mechanics. Thousands of people worked on the construction of the church. Remarkably, Justinian dedicated Aya Sophia a mere six years after construction began. That's pretty amazing. I mean, six years. They built that really quick. A huge 
101 foot diameter central dome rises 160 feet high in Hagia Sophia. People writing about the building at the time said the dome symbolized heaven. The dome is supported, and you can look at the dome in the pictures while I'm reading, okay, because it's actually still there, by four arches, which are themselves supported by smaller domes, and the pillar in a unusual and beautiful architectural system. The many windows around the base of the dome make it appear from within as though the dome floats in midair. The outside of the building is relatively plain, brick covered with plaster, but the inside is decorated with beautiful mosaics, marble columns, and gold leaf. And that's really pretty. Close ties between the church and Byzantine government. A little bit about Hagia Sophia. It was this beautiful, beautiful dome, this uh, architectural wonder. But it, it, it's interesting. It's gone back and forth it, between it being like kind of this museum, a church, and now it is a mosque, an Islam mosque. All right. Close ties between the church and the Byzantine government. Justinian and Byzantine emperors who followed him continued to be deeply involved in both the church and the government. The idea of separation of church and state, which means you don't mix your church religion with what's going on in your state laws and making, okay? Uh, the idea for separation of state was unknown to them. State officials often put their stamp on new objects and made silver to declare that the metal was pure. The silver chalice at far right was created to hold the fruit of the vine. Uh, representing Christ's blood during communion. On the bottom are the stamps of Justinian, and we're looking at the, the, uh, the silver chalice on page 411. That's that silver cup. Uh, are the stamps of Justinian and of three government officials. The map shows the territory of the Byzantine Empire at the time of Justinian's death. Controversies over Christian doctrines continued during Justinian reign. He supported orthodox Christian teaching and opposed heresy. To protect his subjects from false teaching, he forbade pagan, heretics, and Samaritans from teaching any subject. Interesting that he, uh, he forbade Samaritans. Justinian expelled pagan teachers from the academy in Athens. Paul had told the Christians in nearby Thessalonica and Macedonia this. So then, brother, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. All right, guys, um, you have all of your lesson review done for that. Lesson 61 in our student workbook. Well, let's just do some of these together, okay? Uh, the first question says, Justinian I was from where? Where was he from, Joel? Justinian I was from Macedonia. That's right. He was from Macedonia. Mm -hmm. Number two, Justinian the first became emperor after the death of his uncle. His death of his uncle. That's right. The blank of Justinian was one of his political advisors. The what? Um, wife. The wife. And her name was what? Theodora. Theodora. Yes. Theodora. Justinian the first and the king of blank signed the Treaty of Eternal Peace in 532. Now remember, these two, these two areas kept signing treaties, um, but they fought at the Euphrates River. Do you remember? Do you remember who it was? It was Persia. Persia. Persia? Justinian I encouraged, this is number five, foreign trade in spices, perfume, and comes from the earth, or the silk. Silk worm, yeah. Justinian I worked to eliminate blank in government. Oh, All these bad things. Corruption. corruption, that's right. The blank of Justinian was an important building block for a later legal system. It's called the code. code. And number eight, the rebuilding of the Church of Holy Wisdom, the Aya Sophia, was the grandest building project ever seen by Justinian I. And it only took six years. And you can look it up with your parents. You can see it. It's in your book but it's called the Hagia Sophia. It is a mosque today. All right, I enjoyed Lesson 61. I hope you guys too. You guys did too. And we'll work on Lesson 62. See you guys tomorrow. Bye. Bye.